Well, good morning, New Covenant Church. It is wonderful to have you joining us this morning online from home, from your living rooms. Uh, If you're especially comfortable, maybe you're having some breakfast in bed. And it is just great to have you here this morning. Uh, If I have not met you, or if it has been months since you have seen me, uh, my name is Sean. I'm the worship pastor here. Uh, By the end of this quarantine, I'm hoping that maybe my beard uh, is going to be ZZ top length. So once we're allowed to have church again, uh, we'll be doing some sharp-dressed man up here. Now, before I get into my message, I just wanted to say that on behalf of our entire worship team, I just wanted to tell you as our collective church that we miss you, that your worship team misses you more than you could possibly imagine. Although we've had the chance to uh, gather together and record some music for live stream and and pre-record some sets together, it has been a blessing for us to do that, but even in that moment, we couldn't really ignore the fact that we were leading worship for an empty room. So some of you have very kindly reached out and told us that you miss meeting and you miss uh, engaging in collective worship with us. And I just wanted you to hear, just from your worship leader, that we miss you guys. And we are very much looking forward to when we get to uh, resume some level of normalcy again and resume church as we used to know it. So we're looking forward to that day. We are in a series on our mission statement right now, and we have been covering uh, connect, heal, and fulfill. Even though our mission statement is only three words, it's, uh, it's something that we could spend weeks and weeks upon on each one of those three tenets about what does it mean to connect, to heal, and fulfill. And Mike asked me to speak this morning on what does fulfill mean. Fulfill is where we get to see our impact on the world around us. I like to think of it like fulfill is when our faith grows legs and takes action in the world today. So specifically under the idea of fulfill, I'm going to talk about servant leadership and what it means to be a servant leader. Now, if you think that that doesn't apply to you, you're probably wrong. You may have a a title of leadership at your job. You may be an informal leader at your job. If if you don't have uh, the title of manager at work, maybe you're an informal leader. Are you someone whom your peers can go to when they need advice, when they need help, when they need some guidance with a project? Well, then you're a leader. If you have children at home, you're a leader. You are a leader in your own home. Maybe you're a leader in your community, in your neighborhood, on a sports team. Maybe you're a leader in this church. Everybody is a leader in some way. And if you still don't think that you are, This message is about servant leadership. You're still a servant, even if you don't see yourself as a leader. So if you have your Bibles, why don't you turn with me to the book of Philippians chapter 2. The book of Philippians chapter 2. When you're reading the Bible, it's always important to know the context of what you're reading. Who wrote it? Why was it written? What is the purpose? Who was the audience? Things like that. And the book of Philippians was written by the Apostle Paul. And it was written to the church at Philippi. It was a young church that was experiencing some divisions, a lot of disunity, things like that were going on. And so the Apostle Paul wrote this letter to the church at Philippi to address some of the disunity that was taking place. So before we jump in, let's go ahead and pray. Father God, Lord, would you come? God, would you speak to our minds and hearts? God, give us the humility that you desire to see in your people and in your church. Show us how to live it and walk it out and fulfill it in our lives. And God, we seek your glory in this among all things. God, that you would be glorified by what we do. Amen. So Philippians chapter 2, verse 1. The first word in Philippians 2, 1 is therefore. If you crack open your Bible and the first word that you read is therefore, you're not allowed to keep going. You actually have to stop there because a word like therefore is is a hinge word. It's something that takes two ideas and that's the place where those ideas hinge together and this is no exception. Paul is going from one idea, therefore, chapter two, he goes into another idea. So we're actually going to back up one chapter to Philippians chapter one because we want to see what Paul is talking about when he says therefore. So Philippians 1.27, Paul writes, under the heading of life worthy of the gospel, Paul says, whatever happens, 
Conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then, whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in the one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved and that by God. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him, since you are going through the same struggle you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. So Paul says, to live a life worthy of the gospel, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of of, of the gospel of Christ. That's the setting for what we're going to look at in chapter 2. He says, in order to live a life worthy of the gospel of Christ Jesus, this is what you have to do. And he also says in verse 30 about how you're going through the same struggle that you saw I had and you now hear that I still have. Paul is struggling while he writes this letter to this church at Philippi. He's actually in prison. Paul is in prison for the gospel and he will ultimately be killed for it. But he still takes the time to address what this church in Philippi needs to hear as far as humility and as far as servant leadership. So now we know. Paul says... Live a life worthy of the gospel of Christ Jesus. I am going through these trials as well. Therefore, now we're allowed to continue. Philippians chapter 2, verse 1. Paul says, Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. Paul's message here is in humility, serve one another. That's the first thing that Paul tells us. In humility, I want you to serve one another. And verse 4 there sounds an awful lot like the, great, uh, the uh, greatest commandment. In the Gospels, the Pharisees approached Jesus and they said, Teacher, what is the greatest commandment? And although they were asking him that with the intent of tripping him up and trying to get him to say the wrong things, they ask him, what is the greatest commandment? And even Jesus can't give him just one. Jesus gives him two. He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and the second is like it to love your neighbor as yourself. Verse four sounds an awful lot like that. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. So we're gonna use the word humility this morning. And it's important that if we use a word that we have the same understanding of what that word actually means. When people hear the word humility, they think it means that they don't think much of themselves, they have a low opinion of themselves, Uh, They don't have a lot of value on themselves as a person. And that's not the intent. That's not what the word humility means. I I heard a phrase uh, years ago that that really stuck with me. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. It is thinking of yourself less. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. It is thinking of yourself less. We are valuable in God's eyes. We are created in his image. We are his children. And it would be a disservice to him if we thought of ourselves any less than God thinks of us. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. It is thinking of yourself less. And if you think humility is a countercultural idea now in our society, it was even more so countercultural back in Jesus and Paul's day. Back then, everything was about status, absolutely everything. The Pharisees and religious leaders would walk around in these really ornate, robes and and almost like costumes. And when there was banquets in the community, there would be certain places where people could sit and other places where people weren't allowed to sit. Even when it came to places of worship and the temple, only certain people could go certain places because of status. And that is what made Jesus so beautifully scandalous, is the fact that he came onto the scene and he took that entire culture and turned it on its head. And we see him ignoring the idea of status in the eyes of the world. And what does he do? He befriends common fishermen and recruits them to be his disciples. He has dinner with tax collectors 
and sinners. He keeps company of women with bad reputations. He took the entire idea of status and being number one in the eyes of the world and turned that completely upside down. And Paul points directly to Jesus as the example that we're supposed to follow. In those first four verses, Paul says, in humility, I want you to love one another and serve one another. And as that idea progresses, he points directly at Jesus and says, I want you to do it just like Jesus did. Our series on fulfill, the cool part about that, and what I personally like, is that the word fulfill denotes action. It denotes something actually taking place. And Paul points to Jesus because Jesus actually walked that road. He didn't just talk about it. He didn't just think about it. He didn't just encourage other people to do it. Jesus actually walked that road of the suffering servant, of someone who was willing to give up status and actually walk out the role of a servant. And so Paul tells us here in verse 5 as we continue, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. That is servant leadership. That is service. That is action. That is actually living out a value that we speak about in real life. Here we have Jesus, who was God in heaven, and he humbled himself and took the form of a servant and became human. And if that wasn't enough, he died a sinner's death in a humiliating manner on a cross. Jesus humbled himself not once but twice. He humbled himself when he left heaven and came down to walk among us, and he humbled himself a second time when he died on that cross. So with that being our example, how do we humble ourselves and serve like Jesus did? And I think the most practical application is to look at the way that Jesus lived his everyday, mundane, going and coming and going again life and apply that to our life. That's the easiest way to do it. And here's what I've noticed. If you look at the story of Jesus in the Gospels where he's always just living day-to-day life, it seems like the miracles and the signs and wonders and all those things take place while he is on the way to somewhere. If you've ever noticed that, he's, there weren't a whole lot of healing conferences that took place You don't see the disciples stapling up flyers, Jesus is coming to town, we're going to heal all of your infirmities and such. Jesus was always on the way to somewhere when something happened. You see the occasional miracle happen in the temple or in the synagogue, but usually it is in the comings and goings of day-to-day life where we see miracles happen. Jesus served people in the midst of the daily mundane. And so here's how I have learned how to serve like Jesus, is that I have to allow myself to live an interrupted life. Jesus was always going somewhere when an opportunity presented itself. And that's what I've tried to learn, is to live an, inter- is to live an interruptible and an interrupted life. Now, I'm the kind of person that every day I check my calendar first thing when my eyes open. I, I know what I have to do, the boxes I have to check, where I have to be, what time I have to be there. And if I'm not early, I'm late. That's the kind of personality that I have. And only when those things are all done do I allow margin in my life. And I've had to learn over the years that that is not, that is not kingdom thinking. That is not Jesus thinking. I have had to allow myself to live an interrupted life. John 5.19 says, The Son does nothing on his own. He only does what he sees the Father doing. So when we are interrupted in our life, the best way to apply that is to, number one, allow yourself to be interrupted. Allow yourself unexpected divine appointments throughout your day and not treat them as intrusions or interruptions, but instead as opportunities. So when these happen in my life, the first thing that I do is allow myself to be interrupted. I can give this person a few minutes of my time. I can give them five minutes of my day that I can never get back. And then when I'm in the midst of giving that person my time, I try to make sure that I have my spiritual antennas up 
and I ask God, Lord, is there something here that you're doing that you're calling me to be a part of? Because that is the same model that Jesus had. Like I just said in John 5, 19, the son does nothing on his own. He does only what he sees the father doing. That's Jesus. Even Jesus, the son, does nothing on his own. He does only what he sees the father doing and then joins in. And, excuse me, and so in those moments of being interrupted, put up your spiritual antenna and say, God, is there something that you're doing here? Is there something that you're up to that I can be a part of, that I can join what the Father is doing in that moment? Jesus never saw people as obstacles. He always saw them as opportunities, as opportunities for God's kingdom to break through. So here we see how Paul is telling us that in humility we are to serve one another, and we are to do it like Jesus did, and thirdly, we are to do it for God's glory. We know that if we do those first two things, if we serve and if we follow Jesus' model, that God is glorified in that. But really, the end result is God's glory. I want to take you on a little journey here for a moment. I want you to think about what is the greatest sports moment that you have ever witnessed or been a part of? Could have been on television, could have been in person. You could have been on the team, your kid could have been on the team. What is the single greatest sports moment that you have ever witnessed or been a part of? I know we're in Colorado, so I have to mention the 98-99 uh, Broncos with John Elway at the helm. Can't forget that. Or if you're a little younger, maybe it was Peyton Manning in 2016. That time when your team got the glory in the end. Well, let me tell you a little bit about mine. I grew up in Minnesota, and in Minnesota, hockey is not just a sport, it is a religion. I tell people that hockey in Minnesota is like football in Texas. You don't ask people if they play, you ask them where they're playing and if you can come and play too. So growing up in Minnesota, I had a favorite player. He didn't even play for a team in Minnesota because for the majority of the 90s, there was no professional hockey team in Minnesota. My favorite player was a guy by the name of Ray Bork. Some of you know who that is, and you, you might know why you know who that is. Ray Bork was drafted by the Boston Bruins in 1979, and he had a stellar career. He was one of the greatest defensemen to ever play the game. And since I played defense, I loved following Ray Bork's career. And for whatever reason, throughout the majority of his career, his team was never strong enough to make it all the way to the Stanley Cup Finals. They'd make the playoffs some year, they'd miss some years, and even though Ray Bork was a fantastic player, he never quite closed the deal. So after 20 years in the league, at 40 years old, which in hockey is pretty much ancient, Ray Bork knew that he had to make a change because he wanted one last realistic opportunity to win the Stanley Cup. And so he was traded in 2000 to the Colorado Avalanche. Now at the time, I wasn't a huge fan of the, of the Avs. I liked them, but they weren't really my top team. But since I was such a fan of Ray Bork, I decided that I was gonna follow the Avs that whole year to see if he could finally pull it off. And wouldn't you know, after a successful season, they made the playoffs. And they carved their way through all their playoff opponents all the way up to the Stanley Cup Finals. And people were starting to talk, maybe this is the year. Maybe it's finally gonna happen for this guy who's waited so long. And in game six, Ray Bork scored the game-winning goal, forcing a clutch game seven. And in game seven, after a hard-fought game, the Colorado Avalanche won their second Stanley Cup Final and Ray Bork won his first after a 20-year career. And I still remember when Joe Sackick, the captain at the time, skated over to the trophy, took it off the stand, and handed it over to Ray Bork. And Ray Bork, at 40 years old, his beard gray with age, hoisted that trophy over his head, euphoric in his moment of glory. And I remember watching that with my friends, because in that moment, I was enraptured with what was going on, with this long-awaited moment. And one of my friends turned to me and said, oh my gosh, are you actually crying right now? And I was. The Avalanche weren't my team, but Ray Bork was my guy. And after watching his entire career, 20 years, this gray-bearded hockey player finally got his long-awaited moment of glory. There is something so satisfying about seeing the victor win and take his rightful place at the top. 
So you might be asking, Sean, what is that story? I remember that, but what does that story have to do with God's glory? What does that have to do with what Paul says? Well, here we get to see that victory. Here we get to see that long-awaited crowning of a champion. We get to see our guy win. The reward for Jesus' sacrificial service. So I want you to think again about that moment. What was your greatest, the greatest sports moment you've ever seen of victory? Just the cheers, the joy, the glory. And I want you to picture that as I read what Paul describes as the glory given to Jesus after a life of service. Paul continues on in verse 9. Therefore God exalted him, who's Jesus, to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. And at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And the crowd goes wild. I know some of you might think it's, it's odd comparing a, a hockey game to Jesus Christ being named Lord of Lords and King of Kings. But we see what real glory looks like here. When the sacrifice has been made, when the road has been walked out, and when you get crowned King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Now, sometimes we ask, whenever there's a message about service or something like that, there's always a part of us, some of us hear it louder than others, that asks, what's in it for me? Okay, God wants me to serve one another like Jesus did for God's glory. What's in it for me? Our reward is that we get to share. We get to share in God's glory when it's all over. We get to share in God's joy. We get to share in God's victory. And 1 Peter 4, 12, and 13 paints this picture a little bit. The author writes, Dear friends, don't be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice, inasmuch as you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. We participate in the sufferings of Christ, so we can participate and be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. That's why we serve one another. That's why we follow Christ's example, because we get to share in his victory. We get to share in his joy. We get to share in his glory. That's our reward. Serve one another like Jesus did for God's glory. I want to end, I want to end my life well. And some people think it's, it's strange that I have decades left of my life, most likely, and I'm already thinking about how I want to end. And there's a reason for that. Unfortunately, I know hundreds of people who started following Jesus well, but for whatever reason along the way, stopped. Maybe they were tired. Maybe they were distracted. Maybe they were tempted by the temptations of the world, Maybe they grew apathetic. Maybe they grew lazy. I don't know. But it's unfortunate that I know more friends who've done that than I know friends who are focused on ending well. I think the reason I'm so fixated on that is because, sadly, it is so rare. It is so rare to end well. But I need to. When I get to heaven, I want to hear, oh, Sean, well done. Well done, good and faithful servant. I've been waiting. I've been waiting for you to share in my joy. I've been waiting for you to share in my glory. Let's go. What I don't want to hear is, wow, you made it. You prayed the prayer when you were 16 and you meant it at the moment. So come on in. Come on in. But there was so much left undone. There was so much left unfulfilled. Sean, I had so much more for you that was unrealized, but you gave up. I can't hear that. That would break my heart. See, I want to live a fulfilled life. 
I want to live a life that is marked by fulfilling the road that God has for me. And I want to do it by serving other people in humility. And I want to do it by following that example that Jesus lays out of living an interrupted life and listening for what God is doing in that moment and sharing in God's glory, sharing in his joy, and being a part of his kingdom. So how can we apply this? What's something that, that, that we can take with us on the road this week? It's really simple. Let yourself be interrupted. Look for those moments where, you're, where you can live an interrupted life. If you're brave, invite one. Ask that God would give you one. Ask that he would give you interruptions this week. And then in those moments, ask God, what are you doing here in this moment? What are you doing here? Is there something going on that you want me to be a part of? I can give this person my time. I can give them my empathy. What else are you doing here? You want me to pray for this person? That can be scary. But sometimes God calls us to do things that are a little scary. So I encourage you this week, live that interrupted life. Embrace those moments and ask God if you can be a part of what he's doing. Amen? Let's pray. <clears throat> Father God, we want to live like you lived. God, we want to serve like you served. And Lord, we want to see your kingdom come with the same eyes that you send that kingdom to earth. So Lord, I pray that you would give each and every person a moment this week where they can be interrupted, where they can be a vessel for your kingdom. God, would you fill us up? Show us the places in our world that's broken, that needs your healing and your wholeness, God, and would you make us vessels for that? Amen.